right, good morning, good morning, we good? Okay, we are in the book of Revelation. If you have a Bible, turn to chapters 2 and 3. That's where we are going to be here today. And we're going to set a bit of a precedent or expectation for this morning. If you came into church today and you're like, oh my gosh, she's going to be so funny. Not funny at all. This is going to be like straight up info dump for like an hour. You ready? I thought you guys were going to turn on me, but I feel really empowered right now. That's really good. Uh, wasn't Pastor Daryl amazing last week? It was uh, incredible just hearing uh, the way that he set us up so well. Somebody in the congregation went up to Pastor Fanu last week and said, uh, who's the schmuck who has to follow that guy? So uh, my name is Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it's going to be a great privilege for us as we go through. Uh, the book of Revelation, or as Daryl aptly calls it, the revelation of Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, is one of my favorite books in all of the scriptures. There is no time or place that we need this more than right now. And my beef, I think, with kind of the modern day church a bit is that this book has been hijacked from us by really, really bad teaching. If we approach this book with fear, we immediately have a sense and an emotion that it never intended to offer you. The book of Revelation has always been a book of comfort. For millennia, its goal was to inject courage into the church, not to rob us of that courage. And so as we approach it, we have to realize all that it's trying to do. As Pastor Gerald told us last week, here's a couple of its purposes. The first is to set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the future. But the second practical purpose is to set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present. People want to come to this book and they want to add all of their stuff to it. Oh my gosh, this is like the seven, oh, it's like the C's and like the microchips and the vaccines and it's, they're gonna, government's gonna track you and blah, blah, blah. It's like, if you don't wanna get tracked, throw your phone away. You're getting tracked, okay? That's just how it's happening. Eugene Peterson wrote an amazing book on uh, the book of Revelation where he says this, the Bible warns against a neurotic interest in the future and escapist fantasy into the future. We do not approach this book this way. Our whole goal is when we approach all of what Jesus is saying to these seven churches, our goal is to look for similarities and parallels, not for predictions. Our goal is to live the text out not to decode it. You hear what I'm saying? So as we approach this, we have to realize what's happening. John, through Jesus, is, 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 is sending us a visual symphony. He's putting all of these images into our minds in order to purge and refurbish the Christian imagination to what really is going on and what really will be going on. The goal for us is to be within a world that John creates Obviously, Jesus is sending this through John in order for us to have a balanced perspective of what's really happening in the text. So in order for us to have that, I, I think the book of Revelation is kind of like the exam at the end of the book. It's questioning and testing whether you have picked up on all of the illusions of the 65 books before it. The goal is that we have all of this biblical knowledge, but also first century context. We pour both of those together and allows us to understand the book so much more. Here's an example. If I were just to say to you, the fires of heaven descended onto the city as the Canucks were vanquished in the seventh. Okay? You guys just did a whole lot of work there. Biblical illusion, fires descending from heaven, Sodom and Gomorrah, destruction of a city, James and John, when they didn't get their way, let's just destroy this place. Biblical illusion. You have to know that the Canucks are a hockey team playing in the playoffs for the, the championship, for the Stanley Cup. In the seventh game, you added all of those things and the destruction of the city associated to the hockey game. I'm obviously speaking to the riots, but the word riots was never in that sentence. You see all the work you did. That's the whole book of Revelation. It's biblical illusion, first century context. They're mixed up together. And then we begin to realize what is truly going on. And Jesus' main purpose in these two chapters is to talk to the church. 
The church is the primary audience. Seven churches around Asia where he is going to speak to. And this is quite important for us because we know that the church is, church is kind of like at a fork in the road at the current moment. And we have to make a decision of whether we are going to be with him or not. This is what one writer says. When the church is functioning at its best, there is simply no community on earth that can rival it. But when the church is functioning at its worst, there is no community on earth that can do as much damage. History itself proves the point. The church has served untold millions, as is evidenced by the number of churches, hospitals, orphanages, schools, and relief agencies that Christians have founded and operated. But the church has brutalized untold millions as the medieval inquisition and the religious wars of the century, 17th century also demonstrate. Who are we going to be? And these chapters are going to challenge us, but we got to start off a little bit further back. This is what it says. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. Then I turned, or uh, John speaking. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, which is going to represent these seven churches. And in the midst, okay, in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. When, when Jesus is speaking, he is not speaking as someone who is distant and far off, someone who's looking at us from a 30,000 point view. No, no, no. He is speaking as one who is in the midst of his churches. God has never been far away. Whether it's in the pillar of fire or the cloud, whether it's in the tabernacle or the temple, whether it's Christ in bodily flesh, templed with amongst his people or hanging on a cross, he has always been with us and that will never stop. He's in the midst of us. He's with us. He is speaking from the very core of where we are and where we are going. Here we go. Uh, the hairs of his head were like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his, here we go, uh, voice was like the roar of many waters. Verse 16, in his right hand he sell, held seven stars. From his mouth came a, uh, mouth came a sh sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full Strength. Here are all of the descriptions of Jesus that he is going to take and use as descriptors of himself to every church in the beginning of each of those messages. Here is all of the illustrations that Jesus is going to say of himself in direction to the churches. But there's something else kind of going on here. Remember how last week Pastor Gerald talked to us about a chiasm? It's like one half of an X that kind of like pairs, 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 and leads to a singular thing in the middle. And that singular thing in the middle is a point. Well, we have seven different words here. We have hair, eyes, feet, voice is in the middle. And then we have hand, mouth, and face. Which means that the whole point of this particular passage as a chiasm is asking one simple question. As you go through the remainder of this book, are you going to listen to him? Is his voice going to be the loudest thing in your minds? When you think of the discipline of discipleship, it basically goes, are you going to listen to him? The call of the church that Jesus has so proclaimed and always has been proclaiming, are you going to pay attention to his voice? And at the very end of every single one of the letters, he says this, he who has ears, let them hear. Are we going to listen? Okay, seven churches. The seven churches uh, represent the number seven is of completeness. So it's not talking about these are specific churches that have something better than all the rest. For some reason, Jesus has spoken through John to choose these seven churches as a representation of all churches for all time. Seven is going to come up completely uh, all throughout for this completeness. And basically, Jesus is speaking to every church in every age. He's speaking to the whole church. So how do each of these kind of messages that Jesus sends uh, work? So we'll go here. Uh, to the angel. You'll, just, you'll see that every single one of the seven messages is sent to an angel who represents the church. So you see a kind of structure. You see the Father to Christ, Christ to John the writer, John the writer to the angel, and then to the church. 
<clears throat> this is written to the angel. And then you see here in verse 7 that there's a goal in the end of this. So it's sent to the angel, but for what purpose? It happens to be to the one who conquers. Uh, this word conquers in the Greek is nikao, which is uh, the word for victory or for conquering. This is where the brand Nike will get its name for victory, right? It's the one who comes out on top at the end of this. And Jesus' message is to the angels for the church, for those who are going to conquer, to overcome, to be the kinds of people who do such a work that hold fast to who Jesus is under the pressure to compromise. That's who he's talking to. The people in the midst of all kinds of pressure on themselves really begin to make it through. And this conquering is all throughout the book. And every single one of the church's situations is like one part of the battlefield of the spiritual battle. And their local issues actually have huge, everlasting spiritual implications. So how does each of these uh, letters work? Here we go. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. So to the angel... There's a designation of the church. Uh, the words of him, this is going to be important later, who holds the seven stars in his right hand. You see the description that came out from chapter one? Who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So we get Jesus repopulating a passage that he's already said of himself and now dictating it to this specific church. And then he goes on to say something very nice about every church. He says something nice about every church except for the seventh, Laodicea. So he goes, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. This is like, whew, you're getting pumped up by Jesus. This is great, right? And then it all goes so bad. Okay, here we go. Verse four. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Okay, tough. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So we see a very simple structure that's going to happen seven times. It's going to be to an angel, to the church. It's going to say tare lege, to start off each of these descriptions. And then Jesus is going to say something he likes, something he doesn't like. In fact, like I said, he says everything nice to everyone except for Laodicea. And there's two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that he has no criticisms for. And the reason why he has no criticisms for, and I don't want to make a big application of this, I just want you to hear Jesus' heart, that those two churches are the churches that had the most overt persecution towards them. And to the people who are in the middle of the fire, he has nothing bad to say about them. Just think about the character of Jesus through this. It's actually quite a beautiful reminder. And then he goes with this refrain that he'll say to every church, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, this is the victor, the one who listens, the one who does what he wants, um, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. There's some kind of reward. This aspect is going to happen constantly over and over and over again. Seven times he's going to continue this refrain and he does this in the same way. The reason why this is important is because it shows us a dynamic of Jesus where he uses each individual church against itself in its own messaging. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of an example. Uh, so in the last uh, letter to the church in Laodicea, it says this. Uh, well, first start here. Laodicea had three really important things about it. One is that it was a textile center. They had black wool that they would use and they would create garments out of this black wool that they were really known for and they were famous for, this black wool. They were also a financial center. This church was rich, 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 right? They had a whole lot of money. The third thing about the city of Laodicea is that it was a medical hub. And one of the things that they were known for was creating an eye salve for the alleviation of issues with the eye. They made black clothing, they're rich, and they, uh, they made eye salve, okay? 
So now let this color and texture what Jesus is about to say to the church in Laodicea. And there's three particular words that are very interesting. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, and listen to these three words, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and, listen to the color, White garments that you may clothe yourself in the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You hear that? You see how he used like their own city against them? And so you have this knowledge of the first century. You have these ways that Jesus is speaking to these places very directly. And if we miss these illusions, then we start making this whole passage about stuff that it is never about. So let's go back to verse 1. Uh, the words of him. In Greek, this is tade lege. Uh, you have to determine how you read something by the genre that it offers you. You are not going to read a poem like you do a political cartoon. You are not going to read prose like you would uh, an autobiography of some sort. The genre determines how you read it. The, this word, tade lege, the words of him, uh, kind of do something very fascinating. These words would have been the first words in any Roman imperial edict, an emperor would send out a note to any community or city, and it would start off with those words. So Jesus is almost putting himself into the position of the emperor in speaking to these churches. There's a political realm to this. But at the same time, it takes on this Hebrew prophetic oracle. It's a covenant lawsuit that Jesus is saying towards these churches. There are things that you need to do based off of our legal binding relationship and commitment to one another. So Jesus is not only just doing an imperial edict from the Roman world, he is also speaking as a culmination of all of the prophecy that has happened all throughout the Old Testament and the New. And he's merging both of these kind of styles and genres together to say something very profound about himself. The medium is the message. He is both the emperor and the living God, dictating his people to do his great work in the world. This is how Jesus is saying all of these things. He is commissioning us, telling us to do this work that he has so called us to do. He has made this kind of new genre of himself, and within the middle of it has made an enormous claim of who he is and what he is calling us to do. It's as if he walks up to the House of Commons and says, I'm the true monarch. It's as if he goes to the White House and says, I'm the true king. There is this political element as well as a culmination of all of the story of the 65 books before this. This is incredible. And then he talks to the church. This word church is the word ekklesia in Greek. And ekklesia is an interesting word because it has no religious connotations towards it. The word ecclesia was just a civic gathering. It was about gathering together to do the business of the city. Uh, Pastor Darrell is really helpful in the way that we think about this, and he quotes Larry Hurtado, who says this, It appears that the early Christians deliberately adopted and preferred a distinctive self-designation, a term not used by pagan or Jewish religious groups to refer to their gatherings. So what do we see? We see genres mixed together. We see the true emperor and the true God. And we see that he is talking to people who are about the business of the city. This is what Pastor Gerald writes, and I think this is brilliant. The seven messages are spoken to people summoned by the true emperor and true God to conduct the business of the true emperor and true God in the city. To conduct the business of the one lasting empire in the midst of those crumbling all around us to conduct the business of the city of God in the midst of the cities of man. A city 
will be as holy and therefore healthy as the ecclesia of the city. What we do when we gather in the name of the true emperor and the true God has profound consequences for the city, even if the city is not aware of it. And this is how he defines the church. Think about how differently that is for all of us. We are ordinary, broken people, summoned by and gathered around the crucified and risen and ascended and coming Jesus, to share in the life of Jesus and to be engaged in the business of Jesus in the city. It's a very different way of thinking about this, right? Think about the last 20 minutes that I've talked about and how we've not talked about like the end of the world. We miss the point. I always think that we come to Revelation in such a funny way. If I were to tell you the story of the tortoise and the hare, you know, tortoise, slow and steady, wins the race. That's kind of the feel of it. And you come away and you go, who sponsored that race? Like, what are you talking about? No, no, no. Who sponsored the race? Who put the race on? Were they good people? I'd look at you and go, what the heck are you talking about? It's a story about animals running. What are you talking about? This is how we approach this whole book. We get distracted by all of these things that push our attention without missing the whole point. Are we going to listen and not only are we going to listen, but are we actually going to live out of the convictions that he has called us to go to? I'm not going to go through every single one of the seven letters because what's really interesting <coughs> is if I think to myself, what are the categories to which Jesus uh, actually grades us? All of the criticisms and all of the commendations, they actually fall into three separate categories. The three categories are this. Faithfulness and perseverance, doctrine and truth, and works and deeds. Faithfulness, perseverance, doctrine and truth, works and deeds. To the church in Ephesus, he says that you are persevering. To Smyrna, he says you are faithful despite affliction. To Pergamum, he says you are faithful in a hostile environment. Jesus' questions for us is will you acquiesce to the pressures around you? We don't have to look long to think about all of the high school students in this room, the pressures of all the different things that they are called to do on a daily basis whenever they go to school. And the question that parents might have for them is, are you going to just follow the crowd or are you going to be different? I remember doing this uh, thing where I read the whole Bible. This is like a soft flex, but it's okay. <laughs> I read the whole Bible in the book of January, okay? It was psycho. And what's really fun about it is you get these large, broad strokes of the Bible. It's not like minutia where you're looking at one word for like 45 minutes or something. You just have to keep hustling all the way through. And when you do something like that, you begin to realize the really big things that God cares about. And if you go through all these first five books of the Bible, one of the key words that he really, really cares about is this thing called holiness. It's a separation. It's a group of people who are for the business of the city, but also for nonconformity. And the question is, do you live such a life where regardless of whether you have social equity or not, or whether you look good or feel good, are you going to follow him with everything else that is calling for your attention and your life? When you gain nothing from it, are you going to follow him? The word affliction used in these passages is the word flipsis. It's a technical word in the New Testament. It's, it's never used of like normal frustrations of life. It is used when two kingdoms begin to clash. It's the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. It is human pride versus the righteousness of God who calls us to repent. And the goal of this flipsis is that it has called us to get down to the bare essentials of what we build our life on. What kingdom do you want to represent? In the midst of all of the other pressures around you, are you going to stay faithful is the message of these passages. There's a story of a guy named Karl Barth, brilliant theologian, probably the most important Christian thinker in the last 100 years. Karl Barth was not a uh, clean guy. We found out years after that he had passed away that he was actually having an affair and committing adultery from his wife. Not a clean guy. 
Did you know that when uh, World War II broke out and the Nazis were having a uh, claim on the churches in Germany, he looked at those people and said, very easily, all of the social pressure, political pressure, religious, spiritual pressure is saying, I have to acquiesce, and the church has to become associated to this Nazi party. And he stood up in the middle of all of those individuals and said, we cannot do this. And put down what is called the Barman Declaration and started the Confessing Church to go against that movement even though everything else was against us. Do we kind of have that resolve in us? I'm not talking small things. Your friend offers you a blunt, are you going to take it? That's not what I'm talking about. It's too small. We make these about behavior modifications. In the end of all of this, do you know him? Do you have him? Do you act in the soul's paradox of love that you chase after the thing that you already have? Will you be faithful through all of the pressures of the world? And are you going to be the kind of person who conquers? The church in Ephesus was said, the reason why I like you is because of the way that you approach these this Nicolaitans, these, these followers of Nicholas. This word is a word play that John is, is messing with us because the word Nicholas means to conquer people. Are you the kind of people who will be conquered or are you the kind of people who will conquer in my name? That's what he's saying. Will you have victory? Are you going to give in? Why can't we be the kind of church that regardless of the social pressures are around us, people go, they are faithful to him. That's the message of what this is saying. And the only way that we can stay faithful to him is if we know who he is and understand him, which is why doctrine and truth are so important in this passage. To Philadelphia, he says that you have kept his word. To Ephesus, that you discern false apostles. To Pergamum, this is what Jesus has against them. Listen, listen, that you tolerated false apostles' teaching, that you tolerated Jezebel's teaching. Not even that you just permitted, it's because you have this kind of sanitary way of living your Christian life that's so like flowy and easygoing that you don't care about the wrong things of Jesus that are being spread around you. This is what one person writes about this church, what I find very interesting. The church of Sardis was not alive enough to have enemies or confront heresy and had simply become the model of non-offensive Christian faith. What kind of truth do you live under? Do you know him? Do you understand what he's saying, how he's revealed and illuminated himself towards you? Have you, have you known him at such a level where you begin to see, uh, in the words of J.I. Packer, half-truths, masquerading as whole truths, and they become complete untruths? Are we the kind of people who so recognize the real thing when something fake is in front of us, we know exactly what we're doing, and we have the kind of courage and bravery to stand up for what we know is wrong? And we are constantly inundated in the world, and sometimes we can't even recognize what's false because we are consuming everything else. This is how one writer puts it. If you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It's because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world, your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no more room for the great. Doctrine matters, truth matters. And the reason why Jesus is so intolerant towards these falsities and lies because these falsities and lies enslave you. And he looks at the church and says, you are mine. In the midst of all the pressure, do you follow him? In the midst of all the lies, do you find the truth that is in him? Third thing, works. To Thyatira, he says, I commend you for your service and your love. Ephesus, he says, you have forgotten your first love, which doesn't quite seem like that makes sense with what we were talking about, uh, that he, he forgets his first love. Uh, and you found to be false. I know you are enduring patiently. Why am I losing this here? I, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. 
but have tested those who have called apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This seems like an emotional thing, right? Okay, I just need to like sit down, pray, put some worship music on, take a picture so everybody knows I'm doing this. I need to like get my heart back with the Lord, okay? I need to like go to a conference. I need to like listen to sermons. I need to get my love back. No. Why is this the case? The reason why this is the case is listen to what he says for them to do. Have some good emotional vibes. Be psychologically correct in your words to me. No, no, no. What does he say? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Every message to these seven churches ends with two things. You either repent or there's judgment. It's very severe. And what are you supposed to do when you've forgotten the first love? Do the works you did at first. You are called to do something. And how many of us, we sit there so stagnant going, God, tell me what to do. Please. Speak to me. God. I wonder if there is an alternate perspective to this where how about we don't spend so much time thinking about what God might be saying to you and start thinking about the things that he has already said to you that we were not obedient in. A majority of the Christian life is not new information. It is this word, remember. Remember when the Israelites go off base? He goes, hey, uh, buddy, Exodus, remember that? Remember. Remember all those things I've done for you all throughout your life? Remember, go back to those things and let that be the energy in which you through do the work that I've called you to do. Sardis, this church, he says that have a reputation for being alive, but really they are dead. Imagine how much that sucks. Do you think you're killing it? Everybody around you thinks you're killing it. And Jesus goes, no, bro, you are dead. That is the worst. They had events going. They had things going. They were doing stuff for people. And yet, for Jesus' discernment for this, they were dead. So one writer says that all of the church's man-made programs can never bring life any more than a circus can resurrect a corpse. You know what the weirdest thing about the church in North America is? This is so weird. We have found a way to do church without God. We have found a way to preach without God. We have found a way to worship without God. And we have found a way to live a Christian life without God. It looks all good, clean, and shiny on the outside, but on the inside, dead. It's kind of like this uh, app description uh, I heard, I heard Daryl talking about. The Christian life is kind of like water skiing. You only go places because you're holding on to the rope that keeps you moving. And as soon as you let go of that rope, you might be above water for a couple seconds and you look like you're doing well. But you know that if you're not holding on to the source, you're sinking and you're sinking fast. There's a period of time where you look good but there is no momentum and no action moving you forward. It was half-hearted. It was superficial. This church was content with mediocrity. They were busy, but they had no time in their hearts, no space for his kingdom, for his glory, and for his purposes. The thing I love about God is that his grace means that boat always comes back around. And he says these terms that we think are so scary, but when you think about them, are beautiful. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. Remember what you received. Keep it. Repent. He's saying all of these things to stop us from being lethargic. You know that church in Sardis that I talked about? That church was actually... uh, a, a huge fortress. It was, on the, it was on the, uh, built on top of this mountain. And the Acropolis was built on a spur of this mountain. It seemed absolutely invincible, and there was no way for any kind of army to directly assault it by any means. 
But twice, it became too comfortable, too at ease. In 549, Cyrus captured the Acropolis by sending a climber up a crevice of one of the perpendicular walls of the fortress. And then in 218 BC, Antiochus the Great captured the city as a band of 15 men sneaked up the wall and into it, opening the gates from within. The history of Sardis teaches us that we are never more in danger of falling than when we feel comfortable and at ease. The church in Canada is comfortable and at ease. You hear why we need this. In the middle of all the pressures around us in the world, do you follow him or them? In the middle of all of the falsities and and the untruths, do you follow him? In the middle of all of the busyness that you can say to, to live the Christian life, to do this whole thing, the routine of church, do you want to follow him? You know what the best part of this is? He calls you to persevere as one who is with you through the process. He calls you as one to understand truth when he reveals and illuminates it to your own soul. And he calls you to do the work that he first and foremost calls you and then empowers you to do. He is not calling as a person who is distant. He is calling as someone who is amongst you and he's saying, church, are you going to listen? Are you going to listen? Are you going to be the kinds of people who in your own minds follow me more than everything else? And what's his call? Repent. Repent. One of the unique things all throughout these seven words or seven messages is that he really goes after sexual immorality. Imagine, for some of you, somebody walking up to you and saying, Hey, can I talk to you? I have something to talk to you about. And you don't go to your worst secret. Freedom is available to you. The emperor and the true God revealing himself to you and saying, you know that work I have for you, let me be the one who empowers you to do it. To take an audit of your soul, to not run to the comforts or the things that you cope with, but to run back to him, the one who has open arms and embraces you time after time. The boat will always come back around. Are you going to listen? Are you going to pay attention? Are you going to give up? Are you going to believe the lies? And are you going to do the work that you have called us to do? Some of us, we can't even hear the things I just said. The message of these seven letters is very simple. If you want to conquer, you turn to him in repentance. If you want to conquer, you turn to him in repentance. And for those of us whose initial reaction is, I am so unworthy, maybe the lie that you believe is that your sins are bigger than my God. And it is simply not true. Want to know why? I remember going to Greece, going to Italy, going into Rome and seeing the Colosseum this beautiful building of ancient antiquity where people would go in and they would kill each other and they would throw Christians into the middle of it, the minority group of that area, and they were murdered in the midst of it. And you know what's amazing about the one who calls us the true emperor and the true God? Is I paid a ticket to walk around a dead thing. But 2,000 years later, the church of Jesus Christ is strong and doing his work. Why? Why? Because we follow the one who is in our midst. Do what you are called to do, Village Church. Father, we thank you as we are listening to these messages and we're hearing the way that you are speaking to us. I pray that we are empowered. I pray that we move closer to you. We see the way that this is divided out and we are just absolutely floored by your genius and your communication to us. We pray that we would be much, that we would do much of what it is that you have called us to. That in the midst of all the pressure, we would be faithful to you. In the midst of all of the lies, we would come to you with your truth. And in the midst of our busyness and at some times laziness, we would commit to the works that you have called us to do to be alive in your spirit, to change the world in your name. So we pray that you grant favor for our church that we would be a church that embodies those things in the midst of our cultural moment and situation. 
that we'd be faithful, that we would persevere, that we would be so hung on to your truth and we would do the works that you have called us to do. We pray for all of this in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being with us. We hope that you enjoyed the service. We would love for you to attend a service physically with us here at Village Church or join or a community group, or even if it's in your heart, we would love for you to give to support all the resources that we put out from Village Church. Thank you so much for being with us. And we hope to see you again.